Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Rasul Michael and you're watching Kini News, the show that brings you today's biggest stories. How much would you consider pocket money? 50 ringgit? 200 ringgit? Well, how about 2 million ringgit? I doubt most Malaysians would have that much money in their savings by the time they retire. But that wouldn't be an issue for Tengku Adnan though. Tensions remained high for a second day at the Kuala Lumpur High Court as the corruption trial of Tengku Adnan Tengku Manso continued today with the former minister accusing the prosecution of defaming him and tarnishing his image. All that before he revealed to court that 2 million ringgit is like pocket money to him. He accused Deputy Public Prosecutor Julia Ibrahim of trying to damage his image since the first day of the trial. He said as a former minister in the Prime Minister's Department overseeing legislation, he can see where the prosecution is going with their line of questioning. He also questioned why he is still being accused when charges against the former Finance Minister Lim Guaning were dismissed. Today's exchange followed an outburst by Tengku Adnan yesterday when he was questioned about asset declarations he made when he was in cabinet, which revealed that he was once worth around 900 million ringgit. After calming down, Tengku Adnan said there was no need for him to accept funds from third parties, as 2 million ringgit is like pocket money to him. Tengku Adnan is facing a charge for accepting a 2 million ringgit bribe from a property developer. Pakatan Harapan is so comfortable in Selangor that even with the defections by Bursatu and some PKR members, they're not flinching. All five Bursatu assembly persons and two former PKR representatives have been removed from the Selangor government today, following the formation of the Perikatan National Federal Government. Menteri Besar Amruddin Shari said that allocations for these seven representatives would also be frozen. He explained that the removals would also extend to Bursato appointees at all levels of the state government, from ex-co members to village chiefs. Justru, di dalam Pakatan Harapan sekarang, kita mempunyai 43 orang perwakilan dan uh, di peringkat uh, pembangkang yang terdiri daripada AMNO, PAS dan Bebas, Bersatu dan Bebas yang mungkin boleh menamakan diri mereka sebagai Perikatan Nasional, terdiri daripada 13 orang. The two independents are former Menteri Besar Azmin Ali and Gumpak Seti Assembly Person Hilman Idham. The Menteri Besar was speaking to reporters at his official residence in Shah Alam this afternoon. He was flanked by Pakatan Harapan Assembly Persons from PKR, DAP and Amana as he made the announcement. But things are a little different in Malacca. Harapan lost the state to BN and now BN has enough numbers even without Bersatu to form the state government. Malaka BN has retracted its cooperation with two Bersatu Assembly persons, Muhammad Rafiq Naizam Muhyiddin and Nur Afandi Ahmad. Speaking at a press conference today, Malaka BN Chief Rauf Yusuf said they have up to today failed to meet with both Bersatu representatives. Menyebabkan Barisan Nasional Negeri Melaka telah hilang kepercayaan untuk menjalankan kerjasama ini. Oleh yang demikian, saya selaku pengerusi Barisan Nasional Negeri Melaka mengambil keputusan sebulat suara bersama dengan 13 adun negeri Melaka dan bersama dua lagi adun yang bersama-sama dengan kita untuk menarik balik kerjasama dengan yang berhormat Datuk Muhammad Rafiq Nizam Mohidin dan Datuk Nor Afendi bin Ahmad Rauf said they had invited Rafiq and Nur Afandi to meet and discuss their new cooperation after Bersatu pulled out of Pakatan Harapan last week. However, they still have 15 assembly persons on their side thanks to the support of Nur Hizam Hassan Baki of Pangkalan Batu and Muhammad Jailani Kamis of Rambia, who defected from DAP and PKR respectively. This is enough to form a state government with a one-seat majority. Rauf added that this would not affect the spirit of Parikatan National at the federal level. The political developments in the past two weeks may be nerve-wracking for some, but for former Prime Minister Najib Abdul Razak, he sees hope for justice. Former Prime Minister Najib Abdul Razak in an interview with Reuters on Wednesday said that the fall of the Pakatan Harapan government meant he now expected an atmosphere more conductive to a fair trial. In the interview held at his mansion in an affluent neighbourhood in Kuala Lumpur, Najib said he was not alluding to anything because there's no conclusion to the trial, but hopefully he will get a fair trial. He maintained that the charges against him were politically motivated. Najib said he was misled by Malaysian financier Jolo and other 1MDB officials and that he will clear his name in court. 
He is facing five trials over the 1MDB scandal that stretched from Malaysia to the Middle East to Hollywood. According to Reuters, Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin's office did not respond to a request for comment. Najib said he had not spoken to Muhyiddin since he took office, but he hoped to rebuild their relationship. Muhyiddin was sacked by Najib in 2015 after criticizing his handling of 1MDB. Azbin Ali and his gang may need to get their checkbooks ready because their former party is demanding that they pay millions. Do people still use checkbooks? Well, I don't know. Let me know in the comments. Before being fielded in the 14th general elections, PKR made their candidates sign a legal document stating that a lawmaker must pay the party 10 million ringgit if he or she is terminated, defects to another party or leaves the party but remains an independent. This leaves 12 lawmakers who defected recently in a tricky situation. PKR Treasurer Lee Chien Chung said that the party will take legal action soon against the 12 and demand that they pay the party 10 million ringgit each. The lawmakers will be sent a letter of demand next week, to which they will be expected to reply with how they will be paying the 10 million ringgit. Lee said PKR is discussing with their lawyers to gather all the relevant information about the defected lawmakers. The 12 lawmakers include 9 parliamentarians and 3 state assembly persons. This includes the party former deputy president Azmin Ali, who may need to pay 20 million ringgit as he is holding the Gombak parliamentary seat and the Bukit Antara Bangsa state seat. Some may be blaming Dr. Mathur for the nation's political situation right now, but according to the country's youngest former minister, Malaysia's oldest former prime minister should not be blamed. The political drama which led to the collapse of the Pakatan Harapan government should not be blamed on Dr. Mathur Mohammad, according to Bersatu Youth Chief Said Sadek. He said this is because traitors within Bersatu had used Mathur's name to lure MPs to Sheraton Hotel on February 23rd, where Amno and past members were present to form a new alliance to topple Harapan. Sisadeh named Mathur's former political secretary Zayed Mat Arip as the party's number one traitor, who kept using Mathur's name to lower Bersatu MPs to leave Harapan. He said party leaders should have consulted members before deciding to work with AMNO. But that didn't happen and decisions were made hastily. He said Bersatu has opened the door to AMNO to enter Putrajaya, all for position and power. Coming up next, we take a look at the worsening coronavirus situation around the globe. Then we continue our conversation with Professor James Chin to see where Harapan went wrong. This next story is brought to you by Blue Air. Panicking won't protect you from the coronavirus, but being informed may. Here's an update on the global coronavirus situation. The death toll from the coronavirus rose to 11 in the United States on Wednesday as new cases emerged around New York City and Los Angeles. The first death in California from the virus was an elderly person in Placer County. Health officials said that the person had underlying health problems and was likely to have been exposed to the virus on a cruise ship between San Francisco and Mexico last month. It was the first coronavirus fatality in the United States outside of Washington State, where 10 people have died in a cluster of at least 39 infections. California Governor Gavin Newsom declared a statewide emergency in response to the coronavirus, which he said has resulted in 53 cases across the state. That number as of today is 53. I'll remind you that includes 24 individuals that were repatriated in the state of California, 29 individuals uh, that have subsequently been tested positive. Uh, we have accordingly uh, with this new uh, uh, ICU patient uh, that passed away uh, entered into this next phase uh, that has required me uh, under the circumstances uh, to uh, advance a proclamation uh, of a state of emergency. And in Italy, the government closed all schools on Thursday until at least March 15 and took emergency measures to try and slow the spread of the coronavirus. The Civil Protection Agency said that the total number of deaths in Italy rose to 170 after 78 people died from the virus in the past 27 hours. The government adopted a decree to try to slow infections, which has been rising by about 500 per day. The decree orders the suspension of events of any nature that entail the concentration of people and do not allow for safety distance of at least one meter to be respected. 
It called for the closure of cinemas and theatres and told Italians not to shake hands or hug each other and to avoid direct physical contact with all people. It also ordered all major sporting events including top flight Serie A soccer matches to be played in empty stadiums. On Wednesday, the government instructed public sector managers to reorganise offices to help staff work from home. Yesterday, we spoke about the possible outcomes of the nation's political future. But why are we here in the first place? Professor James Chen tells us what Harapan did wrong. So, just going back to what, what the thing we're in right now, what, what, what do you think Harapan's mistake was? Why are we in this, uh, in this mess, basically? So, my take on the situation, of course, the story will unfold over the next few months when more and more insiders come out and tell us happening. But looking as an observer from outside, uh, two things are very obvious. Uh, the first one was that uh, Pakistan lost the narrative after the first year of government. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody remembers, right, before the May 2018 general elections, uh, DAP was the number one in social media. They were so good that, you know, AMNO had no answers to all the DAP yeah. attacks. But somehow after the elections, they sort of gone quiet and somehow the Pakatan Harapan social media never got up and running. So basically after the first year, the first anniversary last year in 2019, you see all these attacks against Pakatan. Uh, so I think first thing was the social media. The second one was very obvious, AMNO and PASS came together. I think that was a game changer that allows them to put out a very standard narrative and that the Pakatan government was basically a DAP Chinese controlled government. <laughs> And that allowed them to win three by-elections in a row. And I think that created a panic situation on the Pakatan side, especially Besatu side. I remember speaking to very senior members of the administration who told me they're looking for a new model. And uh, when I wrote the article in November last year, I remember people accusing me of spreading fake news. And here are more headlines from today. And that is all for me today. For more stories, you can go to kinitv.com. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube and Facebook for the latest news updates. I'll see you again tomorrow, same time, same place. I'm Prasad Michael. Thank you for watching.